Hello, my name is Brian Bilston. I'm here today to talk to you about love. Love is at the heart of my latest poetry collection, Alexa, What is There to Know About Love? I'd like to use a few of the poems within it to explore some of the questions about love which have plagued philosophers for centuries. Questions such as, to what extent is love really such a curious thing, with the power to make a one man weep, make another man sing? How likely is love to tear us apart? And of course, what exactly has love got to do, got to do with it, given that at times it seems to be little more than a second-hand emotion? Now, while I can't offer up any real answers to these questions, here are a few top tips to help navigate some of love's trickier aspects. Let's start by talking about the beginnings of love. How can you tell when you meet somebody that they might be the one for you? That first date is not easy. My advice is to establish some common ground. Bring the conversation around to some topics you both feel invested in, areas of shared interest, such as in this poem, First Date. With so much in common, that was clear from the start, a marriage of souls like the Bova and Sartre. The connection was instant, almost irrational, simply simpatico, fully compatible. You confessed you love winter, North Yorkshire and cats. Me too, I responded. How amazing is that? You're wild about Wharton. You loved Ethan Frome. His best, I said, thinking I'd read and went home. You praised the revival of Pinter's Dumb Waiter. I nodded along. I should Google that later. Discussion then turned to things that you hated. Tarantino, you thought, was quite overrated. You make some good points, I eventually said. I could always hide that box set under my bed. You spoke of a loathing of poetry that rhymes, and I said, yes, that stuff's awful. Once a connection has been made and love initially established, it can be easy to become a little complacent. All those peculiar habits and quirks and peccadilloes that you have that to your partner seem so charming at first may begin to wear a little thin after a while. You need to guard against such complacency. If you find your conversations running in the way they do in this next poem, an exchange of similes, then you may be in trouble. Your beauty, I said, is like the existence of climate change undeniable. My presence, you said, is like the 814 to London Paddington, unreliable. Your eyes, I said, are like Birmingham's municipal baths, made to swim in. My waist, you said, is like a garden hedge that impedes pedestrians when they walk past, in need of trimming. Your lips, I said, are like an obstructive snooker ball, asking to be kissed. My words, you said, are like an out of form batsman, easily dismissed. Your hair, I said, is like a new series of keep fit books, shiny, healthy, and volumized. My dress sense, you said, is like agriculture in 19th century Tsarist Russia, primitive and unmodernized. Your skin, I said, is like Gary Lineker's disciplinary record, without blemish. My voice, you said, is like a painting by Peter Paul Rubens, oily and Flemish. Your legs, I said, are like this line of my poem and compare it to all the other lines of my poem. Long. My taste in music, you said, is like the inclusion of this semicolon. Wrong. A coming together such as ours, I said, is a rare celestial event, like a supernova. Forget it, you said. Our relationship is like this poem. It's over. But when love does come right, it can change your whole outlook on life. Sometimes, though, you may not even know that you're in love. You may simply feel as if you have a fever or a stomachache or a bad attack of gout. You may find yourself breaking into song in the middle of an important work meeting, 
or ruffling the hair of a child who's kicked their football through your front window. Or you may find yourself suddenly immune to all the world's viciousness and cruelties, as documented here in the poem, The News Where I Am. Today, my travel card expired. Got soaked through twice. Oh, and got fired. A dog bit me. I lost my phone. But you'll be there when I get home. A pigeon crapped upon my head. I ate a slice of mouldy bread. I lost a tooth. I broke three bones. Who cares? You'll be there when I get home. My lottery numbers came up today. Shame that I forgot to play. I think I've got a kidney stone. Like, whatever. You'll be there when I get home. The ice caps melt some more each year. A new world war will soon be here. The most perfect day that I've known. Because, did I mention this? You'll be there when I get home. It sounds dull, but the best lovers tend to be very handy with an Excel spreadsheet. For the business of love has a lot of data to be crunched in order to function properly. There are birthdays to remember, St Valentine's Day too, Christmas, and countless anniversaries of the day you first met, the day you got married, the time your partner went into the hospital to have their wisdom teeth removed. Failure to keep on top of these things will lead only to love burying itself deeper and deeper into the entree of everyday life. And no amount of fancy words will get you out of it, as illustrated in this next poem, Wedding Anniversary. I forgot, I said, that since when was our love built on anything so ordinary as a date? Let other couples mark time. I am too caught up with the here and the now of you to waste these hours in commemoration of the past. Because our love is vast, like an ocean, with depths far beyond others' comprehension. Why spend our lives swimming circles in the muddy puddle of convention? Flowers fade, chocolates get eaten. By such ephemera, we should judge our love not. And you said, what do you mean you forgot? There's a lot to recommend domesticity. The routines which play out in a home each day are themselves a manifestation of love. The cup of tea in bed together each morning. The division of tasks concerning the laundry or the emptying of the dishwasher. The cooking of the evening meal, the putting out of bins. Shared hours on the sofa watching the TV. But please be careful. It's a very thin line between domestic bliss and dullness. Watch out for the little signs. A struggle to make conversation, perhaps, or the absence of laughter. Or your partner's three-year love affair with a solutions architect from Ghoul. You need to retain some excitement, such as in this poem, called Gunfight in the Last Chance Saloon. Now we are old, but not quite dead, not knowing if today might be our last. We could devote ourselves to jigsaws, to remembrance of things past. Yes, that would be a blast. I couldn't think of anything worse. Why act as if we're already in the hearse when we still got time to run amok, to cause a stir, to shake and shock our po-faced neighbours when they find our photo in the papers, caught by the cops with our knickers down in a disused warehouse on the wrong side of town, having first taken out a gang of thugs in a brawl over a consignment of non-recreational drugs. We would have gotten away with it too, if it wasn't for my back and your arthritis. Or then again, we could get out of bed at half past ten and have breakfast on the patio if the weather's good. I could mow the lawn and you could prune the roses, then, hang on, stop. Please excuse me while I yawn. It's a sort of life, but only just, and it won't be long until we're dust. So let's think big, go large, be bold. We're not dead yet, we're only old, and there's time left still for us to lead the revolution. We can become saboteurs with secateurs and cut off the supply lines of tyrants and dictators. We can spread slug repellent in the faces of racists and fascists, 
and plunder our allotment of perpetrators of prejudice with mouldy spuds and cabbages. Or, I suppose, we could live out our last days in repose, filling in crosswords and the hours. Let the quiz shows exert their daily pull. We drift in and out on time's tide. How peaceful that all sounds. And how dull. That's not my idea of fun. But a life of crime spent on the run now, there's a life I could abide. We could be a doddery Bonnie and Clyde and hold up banks by depositing a lifetime's worth of coppers from our penny jars. We'd use our mobility scooters as getaway cars and spread panic on the pavements with our drive-by tootings. We'd find a hideout to store our looting, one with a stele, preferably. What was my hit and your dodgy knee? But hang on, there in a hedge, there's something moving. Behind the old pear tree, a sudden glint. A bush that wasn't there yesterday. We're surrounded, it must be time, I think. You grab that walking stick. I'll take my chances with the brolly. On the count of three, let's burst out the door and give them all we've got. You and me, kid. One. Against the world. Two. Just like it always was. Three. It may be that none of this advice works for you. After all, I claim no expertise on the subject of love. I just happen to have written a few poems about it. I've also written poems about grammar, war and peace, and the Fibonacci sequence. I know very little about those things either. So if you found all of this advice hopeless, and you're still really struggling with what one philosopher described as this crazy little thing called love, maybe do what I usually do in such situations. Try searching on Google for an answer. There's a lot of stuff about love on Google. This final poem I'd like to read to you is composed from real-life auto-completed searches that people have entered into Google. And so it gives you some insights into the kinds of questions that other people are asking and the answers that they're getting. It's called Love in the Age of Google. Is love an abstract noun? Is love a verb? Is love actually on Netflix? Is love a word? Love is a temporary madness. Love is a hurricane. Love is a smoke made with the fume of sighs. Love is a losing game. Can love last forever? Can love break your heart? Can love to shop vouchers be used online? And love by its scar. Love can build a bridge. Love can set you free. Love can hurt Ed Sheeran. Love cannot heal me. Does love cure depression? Does love have an age? Does love joy marry Charlotte? Does love always fade? Love does not need an explanation. Love does not exist. Love doesn't need a slogan. Love is all there is.